it, it's a major concern. It, they're, they're absurd. It's, it's complete and utter insanity. So, you know, when I was in my doing my commerce degree at McMaster back in the 80s, early 80s, uh, that's when Ronald Reagan was president. That's when they first went over $1 trillion, I believe it was 1983. It's now 35 trillion. So you've had a compounding at over 8% a year with a growth in the GDP of about 4% a year over that time frame. So you've got about a 4% per year gap over the last 50 years almost. So this is not sustainable. It is what you call insanity. You can't take a jet debt to GDP from 30% to well over 100% and then think you can continue to do that. Hi, and welcome to Wealthy On. I'm James Conner. Well, 2024 is shaping up to be one hell of a year. The economy continues to be very strong. The jobless rate is low. The S&P and the NASDAQ are making new highs every day. But there still feels like there's a level of uncertainty associated with the health of the underlying economy and whether or not we're going to go into a recession. To help make sense of all of this, my guest today is Jonathan Willem of Rocklink Investment Partners. And Rocklink is a wealthy on endorsed financial advisor for Canadian investors. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Toronto? Thank you very much, James. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the weather's getting a little better and uh, the Leafs are out of the uh, Stanley Cup, which is uh, typical, unfortunately, as, as a Torontonian, we all love our Maple Leafs. But um, yeah, things are things are going along quite well, um, other than uh, just watching the political situation uh, in our country and some of the uh, some of the concerns we have there. But the stock market itself and certainly some of the commodities are doing better this year. And uh, that's lifted the TSX and uh, making it one of the better performing indexes and some certainly some opportunities that we found in the market. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear the uh, or see the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> it's out on the playoffs, but I guess it's no surprise. But still, I was really rooting for them this year, even though I'm not a Leafs fan, but I do really support their fans. They got an amazing fan base. Yes, it, it is. It is something to behold when you go to the Maple Leaf games. I, again, I don't really follow. It's a long season and it's, it's tough to stay engaged for the whole season. But when they do make it to the playoffs, it just lightens up the whole area, the whole greater Toronto area. I think it uh, gets into it and gets excited. So uh, it would be wonderful if um, we can win that cup after after all it's been. I think it was in 1967 since we last won it. Uh, and uh, so we'll see what happens. It's uh, We're eternal optimists here. Yeah, it's been a few years. And it's been quite a few years since a Canadian franchise has won the Stanley Cup. Yeah, which isn't fair because hockey's our game, right? It started in Canada. So uh, that's our sport. So let's move on now. Before we examine your investment approach and where you are allocating dollars to this economy and the stock market, I want to get your views on the economy. The U.S. economy has been amazingly robust, but there feels like there's an underlying element of uncertainty, a sense of uneasiness. And this was reflected recently in the consumer confidence number, which came in at the lowest level since July of 2022, so almost two years ago. And what's your sense of the U.S. economy here? Well, I mean, again, I think you have to make a, a, a separate, separate, do a separation between what we're seeing on Wall Street and some of the enthusiasm with stocks and then what's really happening on Main Street. And so, you know, in us, and from, from our perspective, those can't stay detached forever. And so, yes, you've got a lot of enthusiasm on Wall Street. They're looking at these numbers and they say, OK, things are trending the right direction. Interest rates, you know, we might get some cuts this year. I mean, at, at the beginning of the year, as you know, it was like they were going to just slash rates. Now it uh, looks like, well, it would be lucky if we get one or two rate cuts and uh, and so forth. And yet there's this tremendous optimism that continues to percolate. Um, on Wall Street, in particular amongst some of the large tech st stocks, but it's also it's also um, filtering down into even some of the smaller stocks and securities. But on Main Street, as we see here in Canada, um, it's tougher times, and uh, so people have much larger mortgage payments, car payments have gone up, insurance for cars, autos has skyrocketed, food costs have gone way up, um, and so consumer spending is being pinched significantly. People are concerned about the future. And so that, I think, uh, is, is starting to come through in the numbers. We see it, especially in uh, the retail numbers and uh, in, in discretionary spending um, is, is coming down. Restaurants uh, um, spending and so forth has also been impacted. So I think the picture actually on the street is much tougher and much more difficult 
um, for the average person, given the rapid rise in inflation over the uh, certainly the Biden years, the last three years, three, four years and versus the income gains. And uh, and and all we have is more and more threat of more taxes and uh, and uh, from the government. So I see a bifurcation. My concern as an investor is we want to make sure we're buying businesses that are resilient, can take a tougher environment because I think it's coming. Um, and I think uh, Wall Street is going to have to wake up to some of the more more of the uh, underlying and long term realities that are facing the market. And when you say you think the U.S. consumer is under pressure, what are you looking at specifically? Are there any indicators specifically that tells you that they're in trouble? Well, yeah, the spending numbers. Um, I mean, the, and, and so you've got uh, where, where people are spending. So they're not spending in the areas that are you know highly discretionary. Those are starting to come down. So we're seeing that in again in food food numbers. You're seeing it in uh, in terms of the uh, uh, well, even Target's number just released this morning. I mean, they're under a certain amount of pressure. You've seen it um, in um, in restaurants and uh, restaurant spending, Starbucks and, and so forth. And so you're getting pressure in those particular areas. And, um, and so that's where I think you're starting to see some of the, you know, some of the pressure and some of the um, issues. You're also seeing the large uptick in debt. debt. So we look at um, credit debt, and that's gone up a great deal. Um, people are borrowing more money. Um, their savings rates are down. The saving level is one of the lowest it's been in a long time. So they're consuming every dollar that they're earning. And that's, again, not a good thing if you're not building up savings in the economy. So I think you're seeing it both in terms of spending patterns where people can pull back. They are starting to pull back. And of course, you still have to continue to buy the basics and you continue. You, know, you still have to fund um, a lot of your necessary expenses where it's inelastic demand. You know, you just can't stop spending. But you're also seeing it in the uptick in debt in credit card debt, um, in mortgage debt and so forth. So that's that those are concerns for us. Yeah, you raised a few interesting points and you mentioned the word bifurcation earlier. And this is definitely we see this continuously throughout um, consumer spending habits. And you touched on Starbucks. So people aren't throwing out seven dollars for a Frappuccino anymore. But at the same time, I recently read an article about Delta Airlines and one other it might have been United. But they were saying the uptick in the number of flights going over to Lisbon and Madrid. Uh, has corresponded with Taylor Swift playing in both of those cities. And I believe I heard their, their flights to both of those cities were up 25 plus percent. So there are still consumers out there spending a lot of money, you know, going to a Taylor Swift concert. Yeah, there are pockets. There's no question. I mean, I look at uh, just airfares. I keep an eye on the airfares and there, there's certain routes and certain destinations people are paying up for. It's emotional and people will go into debt and spend money that uh, they might not even have. But overall, when I look at the airfare rates and I'm looking more just on the Canadian airline um, industry, I'm surprised at the discounting that is taking place. I'm getting hit every day with, uh, you know, from Air Canada, from WestJet, other um, organizations where, you know, you can get uh, pretty, pretty substantial deductions in rates. So I'm not sure. We'll have to see exactly uh, how much people are spending on flying uh, over the summertime. But yeah, sometimes there are destinations and certain routes that uh, are fairly robust and uh, there's certain traffic. Taylor Swift seems to have that influence in certain areas. And don't ask me why, but uh, she does. So you touched on debt levels and I want to talk about the federal debt now. It's currently at around $35 trillion. It's increasing by $1 trillion every 100 days. These and when I go when I touch on these numbers, it just blows me away. It's like we're throwing yeah. around trillion dollars now like it means nothing. And um yeah. And so I want to get your thoughts on this. And then uh, we can't forget the fact that it is an election year. So the Biden administration has been spending trillions of dollars to keep this economy going. I recently read an article that said for every one trillion dollars that we are getting in terms of GDP, it's costing U.S. taxpayers one point five trillion. So not a good use of funds. But what are your thoughts on the U.S. debt levels? And is this an issue of concern? It's a major concern. It, they're, they're absurd. It's, it's complete and utter insanity. So, you know, when I was in my doing my commerce degree at McMaster back in the 80s, early 80s, uh, that's when Ronald Reagan was president. That's when they first went over one trillion dollars. I believe it was 1983. It's now 35 trillion. So you've had a compounding at over 8 percent a year with a growth in the GDP of about 4 percent a year over that time frame. So you've got about a 4 percent per year gap over the last 50 years almost. 
So this is not sustainable. It is, is what you call insanity. You can't take a jet debt to GDP from 30% to well over 100% and then think you can continue to do that at a increasing rate. In other words, the second derivative, uh, you know, is, is actually you know positive number. So you're growing now debt at a level where, as you've already pointed out, I've seen different numbers for every increase in uh, dollar in debt, you might be getting 30 cents of GDP. I mean, this is a complete flop. This will not be able to continue. Um, so it's not sustainable. And the very fact that it continues to be sustained, you know, it continues to go on does not mean it won't come to an end. And so I think investors need to be very careful. Um, when, you're, when you're adding a trillion dollars every 100, 120 days, um, uh, on a tax base of six to seven trillion, you know, federal government. I mean, it just, it, it, you cannot make these numbers up. So, um, no, it's not sustainable. And that's one of the reasons why I think you've got commodities, uh, things that are priced in U.S. dollars, gold in particular, silver, uh, starting to go up and people are being concerned and using these as safe harbors. Um, there's no way we can we can continue to have a standard of living and, and have a stable economy with this kind of debt being added to the system, and particularly with the world's leading economy and also the reserve currency of the of the world. So I think investors need to wake up, and they need to be again. I'm not saying run from the market, but you need to be allocating capital intelligently, wisely in different areas that at least might you know, protect your purchasing power. There was I saw a great chart the other day. And it just had, uh, you know, from gold from the time that Nixon uh, took, you know, basically the U.S. off the last vestiges of the gold standard back in August of um, 1971. You know, it's $35 an ounce. It's now around $24.50 or so. And uh, that's actually grown faster than the S&P over the same period of time, if you take that uh, 50, 53 year span of time. And so what that tells you, though, is that we've seen a massive devaluation in currency. And uh, and so if we've already had that, look, watch out ahead. I mean, you cannot be continuing to add this debt. We've seen it also in Canada. We've seen it in many countries around the world. But the U.S. right now is out of control when it comes to their debt. So if I was to play devil's advocate here, we've been talking about debt levels for decades now. And you made mention of the fact that back in the early 80s, the federal that was only $1 trillion, now it's $35 trillion. So it keeps increasing, and yet the economy continues to grow. Why should I be concerned? Why should anybody be concerned about the debt levels? Because the economy is growing based upon debt and eventually you cannot finance that debt. And we're, I mean, we're basically at that point now, James, when you think about uh, in order to finance the debt uh, as a result of the uh, so-called pandemic that we went through, uh, the COVID fiasco, um, what did they did? They expanded the balance sheet. They basically just printed the money. So in Canada, the Bank of Canada, you know, expanded the money supply by three, four hundred billion dollars, which was sort of equal to the debt. In the U.S., they went from a couple trillion up to almost nine trillion dollars bank, the level of uh, of money printing, and then they've pulled that back now to sort of the mid mid sevens trillion dollars in the U.S. So we're already at the point where you know they call it the Minsky moment or whatever you want to call it where we can no longer fund the debt through tax dollars um, efficiently and effectively, which means that you've got to use your central banks to buttress the support of your debt. If you're doing that, that means you're adding to the money supply, you're devaluing your currency. So we're at that point. The issue is, you know, when will the market fully realize that? And uh, when will that get priced in? And when will there be more discipline forced on our governments? I don't know the answer to that, but our view is be prepared now and, uh, and sort of do your investing and your stock market allocation based upon the fact that uh, we could be in for some tougher times. So I just want to summarize what you said about the U.S. economy. Even though you think there's impending problems associated with the debt levels, you're still fully invested. No, we're running. Well, we're running. Um, I mean, it's going to vary by client because we, of course, are fully discretionary money managers and it depend on the clients coming in. We've got some that are retirees and some that are young you know, professionals building their portfolios. But overall, um, I, we, we're running around 65 percent in equities, 35 percent short term, very safe uh, fixed income investments. So, no, we, we're keeping some powder dry and some money off the table. Um, but we and, and, and the companies that we are buying, we're trying to buy companies that do have long term secular growth are in some of the more favorable areas of the economy are not leveraged financials, uh, which could take a bigger tumble. And so we've really tried to allocate in areas that would be more robust and uh, and have a stronger uh, and higher resiliency uh, to 
the challenges that we see c- c- could emerge at any time in the market. Okay, so before we examine how you're allocating capital and what name specifically, I want to continue on the discussion with the economy. I want to look at the Canadian economy now. And given that we both reside in Toronto, I want to get your views on the Canadian economy. GDP per capita has been in decline for five years, while at the same time, this number has been increasing in the U.S. Canadian labor productivity has been in decline for 10 years. Real incomes have been in decline for a number of years, and there's no reason or this is, should be no surprise given the excessive tax burden that we face in Canada. But what are your views on the Canadian economy? Yeah, and, and even when you look at the U.S., the growth in GDP per capita and so forth, they're all at very low levels, but they are positive and they have been expanding, which, which is a, a testimony to the resiliency of the American economy and the American people in business. In Canada, we have just been walloped by... Um, policies that are so detrimental and so dangerous to our economy. So, you know, we've had a massive expansion of the state in this country. I mean, so just on the federal level, we've had about a 40% increase in the size of the government over the last five years. I mean, this is unthinkable in terms of the expansion of the state, which we've seen under the Liberal NDP coalition. Um, We've had the tax burden continue to go up, in particular, the taxing of energy. So we've had this carbon tax uh, which is supposedly supposed to solve um, all of the climate uh, climate issues, just tax people, and that somehow mysteriously is going to solve the ta- the, the uh, climate issues. And so our energy costs are incredibly high. And as you know, James, energy runs through everything. If we're going to solve any of these issues, we've got to drop energy costs. We must make it cheaper for energy so we can produce, manufacture things at a lower cost and so forth and get inflation down. And uh, so we've had these incredible tax policies, regulations. Uh, the, the Again, the current federal government has added just unbelievable level of re- regulation, similar to the Biden government might add in the United States, which has added a lot of regulations. And, and one of the reasons maybe for a more positive look in the United States is that the market's already looking forward to a change in government in November, um, which would be much more positive for the economy. But in Canada, we've got these regulations. We've had Trudeau uh, government um, interfere with over $100 billion of capital projects. Now we've got a budget that just came down, which wants to increase capital gains taxes, which is the worst thing you can do when you've got capital leaving your country to put a heavier tax on it. And so we've all these policies, which um, uh, which are really driving the economics in, in our country, uh, not to mention, of course, immigration, which, again, we we you know, we, we look forward to immigration as Canada is a country that's been built on immigrants coming here. But they have to come at a rate where you can assimilate them and you have the infrastructure to incorporate them effectively into your housing market, your educational uh, institutions, along with your health care system. And we've been bringing in two and a half percent population growth to our base and it's just impossible to keep up so we're stressing all of our basic institutions and so you do all of that and you have these kind of policies then yeah you're going to end up with the numbers that you've seen the canadian economy is under tremendous tremendous stress and uh it's essential that canadians um you know push back against our politicians and these policies and uh and they must be reversed these are policies which are um outrageous and uh and are going to do continue to do more harm to our country Yeah, and I just want to put this into perspective for our viewers. Canada has a population of 40 million people. In the year 2023, the Canadian government brought in a million additional people. Half of those people, or 500,000, came into the greater Toronto area, which has a population of 5 million. So our population increased by 10% just in the greater Toronto area alone, putting huge stress levels on the infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah. When you those, that's a good way of looking at it. And um, yeah. So so when you you do all of that and you bring in people that um, again you don't even have the economy that can integrate them into productive jobs. In some cases, you have professionals coming to Canada and they can't even get into their profession. I mean, they're they're held up by regulatory uh, restrictions and so forth. So. Why you, do you want to bring in doctors if you can't get them to work in the medical field? Or why do you want to you know, you bring in people that uh, we need in the construction industry if they're not going to work in the construction industry and so forth? So it's, it's, it's yeah, it's just a, a really mess in terms of policies and lack of forethought. And this is really causing a lot of uh, challenges in the Canadian economy. It's also getting Canadians very frustrated with the system. And uh, so we've had uh, a lot of money has been leaving the country. In 2023, it was uh, somewhere around 40, 30, 40 billion dollars or more left the country. And that's that's a substantial amount of capital 
um, that uh, we cannot afford to, to leave the country. I mean, we're a resource-based country, James, and, and I think you know, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world in terms of the natural endowments that we have in our country, and we need to develop them. But if you're going to develop them, you need capital and you need a regulatory regime that will reward that capital and let it flourish. And, um, and so uh, uh, that has not been the case. And so what we've seen is just a stifling of many of our core industries. And, uh, and this is, again, something that has to be reversed if we're going to continue to see you know, wealth grow and GDP per capita actually increases, which is what we should be shooting for. And you made mention of how large the federal government has become in recent years. Can you put that into perspective in terms of the number of employees that have been hired that work for the federal government and also in terms of GDP? Yeah, I don't I, I don't have the numbers. Um, I don't have the numbers in the federal bureaucracy, but uh, there has been a 40 percent increase in the federal bureaucracy over the last, uh, you know, just pre COVID up until the current situation. And so one can just imagine um, we had a very large state in the first place. The federal bureaucracy was already large to increase that by 40 percent is just um, unthinkable, really, in terms of the numbers. But in terms of the, it's interesting as when you look at the government spend and, and, and when I talk about government spend, federal, provincial, municipal, so all three levels of government. Back in 1960 in Canada, we were just a little over 15% of the GDP would have gone to those three levels of government. In 2021, which was at the height of COVID and also deficit spending, it was 52%. Currently it's about 46%. And so you have almost half of your economy being subsumed by the public sector at one level. And the United States, it's low 40s. In, in, in France, it's just for, you know, just for some comparisons. In France, it's actually a little over 60%. But, you know, you cannot, in, in my view, and I think in anyone who really looks at this objectively, you cannot have the government being almost half your economy, federal, provincial, municipal, and have a productive, growing, wealth, wealth creating economy. Because government sector, by its very nature, is not there to create wealth. It's bureaucratic, it's inefficient with resources, it's also unaccountable. So the larger they get, the more inefficient they actually become. And we see this in, in all the different areas. We see it in healthcare, we see it in our education system. The more money you put into them, the more inefficient and ineffective they become, and they're unaccountable. And so this is really strangling the Canadian economy and most of our Western democracies. We have gotten fat, we've gotten um, somewhat lethargic, um, we don't have the competitive spirit anymore, and we've let government take more and more of the economy. And we're and we, the, the result, of course, is increasing debt per GDP, decreasing wealth levels, and so forth. So the only way to reverse this is we must slash the size of government. We must have the private sector become more involved, take over large swaths of the economy uh, so that we can drive efficiency and effectiveness with capital and down the regulations. And unless we're prepared to do that, uh, it's going to be a tough, tough slog for us going forward. And uh, um, I think Canadians, again, are going to have to realize that uh, government is not the answer. Uh, what the answer is, all of us getting to work and working hard and being entrepreneur, entre entrepreneurship and rewarding capital and um, investing back in our country. So we have a declining economy, and, and I want to get your views on what this means to the Canadian housing market. And I recently had a discussion with David Rosenberg, and he thinks we have a major reset coming in the housing market because in Canada, we can only get a three-year and a five-year mortgage. And a lot of the people that got a three-year mortgage, they're going to be coming up for renewal soon at a much higher interest rate, and therefore their monthly payments are going to be significantly higher. What are your views on the Canadian housing market? Well, we've already seen in, in many of the markets surrounding the Toronto area, 20% or more drop in the prices. And uh, I have a, a couple uh, young, um, you know, 20, 20 year old, mid 20 year old ch children, and one just purchased a place and, uh, and a very nice, modest you know, town home that they can start off often. But that, that's it, it was down about 20, 25% from the peak. And uh, so we are seeing um, the, the, the drop in the real estate. We're also seeing increased numbers um, on the marketplace and um, housing, houses staying on the market much, much longer, much, much longer. And so I think David Rosenberg is, uh, is fairly right and accurate in terms of his analysis. Uh, the mortgage costs in many cases are up 50, 60, 70, even 100 percent if there's refinancing. And that's crippling to people because it's not just them. You know, again, it's not just your mortgage payments gone up. Taxes continue to go up. 
uh, price of transportation and cars is going up. The insurance for all, all your house and your cars are going up. The food costs have gone up. Trudeau's put our taxes on gas is up. I mean, we're paying almost $2 a liter. Um, we're paying, uh, I go down to the Caribbean occasionally, and we have a, an offshore in, uh, fund in, uh, in the Cayman Islands. So I was down in Grand Cayman recently, and I did the analysis. And you can buy gasoline in a little small Caribbean island at the same price you pay in Canada. Um, and so these these prices are it, it's just too much. So the, so that's going to continue to put prices you know pressure on the housing market and people's ability to fund these things. Um, and so we see it with our I mean, we're running a wealth management company. So we've got um, you know over six hundred clients, and um, and we see it in some you know in the eyes of someone some of them when they come in. I mean they're under a lot of pressure and their the budgets are really really tough, and they're having to cut back. And um, the, you know any anyone's been in a big mortgage. Uh, situation and they have to refinance it's really really putting pressure on the family finances and so i think uh, it, it does mean that uh, unless rates really were to come off substantially then um, the prices are going to have to break um, so that people can afford the houses even and that's with a a that's even with the, the, the supply constraint that we have in this country. I mean, if we didn't have such a supply constraint, I think the prices would have dropped a lot more if we didn't have all the immigrants coming in too. And so you've got these other things that push in one direction and then you've got the economic reality pushing the other. But the economic reality, I think, is winning out. And a lot of the people coming to our country now are not all that wealthy. Many, many of them are coming from difficult situations. They don't have the money to afford uh, these houses. And, uh, and so that's creating problems for them also. So I, I would subscribe and uh, think very highly of David Rosenberg's um, yeah, economic views. And just for the benefit of our, of our U.S. viewers, uh, we're paying about $6 a gallon in Toronto, and that compares to $3 a gallon in the state of Michigan, which is right beside the province of Ontario. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that, that's assuming, I guess, a three, three, was it 3.8 liters to three and a half, three, to American gallon, if you're doing the American gallon versus an imperial gallon. But uh, it's, you know, when you're up to $2 a liter, yeah, sometimes in, in, you know, even if you convert it to, to US, yeah, it'd be at least, at least $6. Yeah, US, it's, it's, these are crazy numbers. And then, man, we're the, we're the second, third largest oil reserve in the world. <laughs> okay, so you're not um, so you have concerns about the Canadian economy and also about the Canadian housing market. What about when you look at the Canadian banks? Because of course they're carrying a lot of mortgages. Are you concerned about these loan loss provisions with the Canadian banks? Yeah, I mean it, it, we're we're probably one of the most unusual um, money managers in the country. Uh, I mean I'm sure there's a few others like us, but uh, not very many. We have about one percent of our assets exposed to banks. So um, and that's with as you know, in Canada, the banks can do no wrong. And that's where you put your, you know, at least a quarter of your money or more. Our, our view is they're highly leveraged financial, financials in a middle of a debt crisis. And so um, their assets are Canadians' liabilities. And so, as you point out, even if we don't have a major blow up, we just think that they're going to be tough slugging for the banks for some time. And that, uh, you know, in terms of real large capital increase in the value of them or capital growth, it's going to be very limited. And at best, you're going to collect the dividend. At, at worst, they, yeah, they're going to see non-performing loans go up and their exposure to other areas of the economy could put pressure on them. And so we have not had banks now for several years. I mean, very little. We have uh, drips and drafts of some banks. And, um, and so we're very careful about leveraged financials, because if there is a problem in the market, as, we, as, as people should know, um, the value of the banks can drop precipitously and very quickly. So let's continue on this discussion with the, the stock market and where you and your team are investing money right now, both in the U.S. and Canada. The S&P and the NASDAQ have been ripping and they continue to make new highs every day. But as a value investor, where do you see value in this market? Yeah, I mean, well, we, we continue to look at a number of sectors. I mean, so technology is one that you really cannot avoid um, because it is to us is basic infrastructure. It's essential. So we are we have a number of investments in the technology space. If we can find um, companies at reasonable values. Now, we bought we added a lot of Amazon in 2023. Um, because in 2022, I was shocked at uh, Amazon. It went down by about 40 percent. And yet the numbers just continue to chug along. AWS, its cloud business and so forth continue to go along. So, so we, we've got a fair bit of Amazon on our books relative to other investments. And part of that, again, is just we like the business and it continues to grow and got really got quite relatively inexpensive in 2002, 2020, 2022, 2023. 
Um, but we also like software business. We own a company like Roper, um, which is a leader in software. And people don't know the Roper name, but they have uh, they dominate a number of verticals below them in software. Software companies are nice. Um, Autodesk, which is you know the leader in CAD um, and uh, all the construction people, architects use them and so forth. The companies like that. We have a number of investments in infrastructure which has been tougher go because anything that's sort of in infrastructure where you've got a large amount of debt on the balance sheet by the nature of the industry and interest rates go up, it does put pressure on those companies. But we've tried to do is buy infrastructure companies where they're very sophisticated with the use of debt, they're growth businesses, they're not highly regulated utilities. Um, and so we, we've owned a number of the Brookfield companies, Brookfield Infrastructure, Brookfield Renewable. Um, we like that space. Um, um, Book Real, Book Real Renewable, uh, as you as you probably know, just did a great deal with Microsoft. A lot of these tech companies are so energy hungry, with AI and the data centers. Um, they have and they want to be green and they want to you know look good and virtue signal to the markets. Um, so they have to acquire renewable energy. And so uh, you know they they're going to companies like Brookfield and signing up uh, uh, large large long term you know purchase power agreements with uh, Brookfield Re uh, Renewable. So that's an area that we've been involved in. Um, we do have some in gold, silver, precious metals. Again, you'd you'd probably ascertain that from my my concerns over the debt. Um, we love some of the royalty companies and we have probably about 18% of our total assets um, exposed to some of the precious metals area, which is pretty large when you consider that's 18 out of 65% of our equities. So it's uh, a good proportion of our investments and uh, some consumer um, um, staple businesses, uh, Church and Dwight, um, you know, some boring companies like, you know, like that, some health, some in the health area. Um, Dan Danaher uh, is uh, relatively inexpensive and is a leader in uh, medical supplies, medical equipment, um, analytical equipment, things like that. So, yeah, we, we, we intersperse across a different number of industries. Snyder Electric, we've added uh, just recently. Um, we like that business because they're also part of building data centers and they also have a lot of the componentry that goes into utilities, which have to be continued to be you know, built up a lot more money going to utilities to, to fund the, this transition to uh, electric vehicles and you know, demands on the utility system. Yeah, so looking for the, the specialized areas where we can find great businesses, nice purchases, good secular growth behind them, well-managed um, well-financed companies. Um, that, that's really what, what, what we do. So you mentioned that you do have a large allocation toward precious metals and your focus is on royalty companies. Why royalty companies as opposed to miners? Yeah. And so um, we, we, have a, we have a couple of miners, but if we go into that space, it's usually really the elite miners and ones that have you know, good good areas, good you know political you know political exposures and so forth. So Agnico Eagle has been one that's been a core holding um, that we've had for a while. But mining is a very very tough business. The economics are tough, and we love cash flow and we love predictable cash flow. And so and, and but we want to have exposure to gold, silver, copper is increasingly important. Uh, because of electrification, um, even oil and gas, if you can get a nice royalty off oil and gas, that, that's very effective also. So that's why we've gravitated to the Franco Nevadas of the world, the wheat and precious metals, which just hit an all time high yesterday um, on the market. Um, uh, Sandstorm, a Cisco royalties. Um, we have a little company, a small little company that we think is going to double and triple in the next uh, next two, three years, uh, even if the price of gold doesn't go up. Uh, gold royalty, it's a small little company, but it's got some great royalties and cash flow is going to can really, really ratchet up in the next little while. We like those businesses because they're basically investment bankers to the mining industry. And so you can diversify, They've, you can have exposure to many locations, many political jurisdictions, uh, a number of different commodities. And it's all, you know, last first dollar in is your last dollar. So they invest and then they get this perpetual property right and royalty on that property for forever, basically. And so um, we like that business model. It's, it's a real cash flow generative business model. And we've done well on it for many, many years. Uh, long before I did Rocklink, I was the CEO of uh, AIC Funds, and we were one of the largest investors in Franco, Nevada. And we just loved that business and what uh, Seymour Schulich and Pierre Lassonde did there. And it really, really... Uh, awakened me to the opportunity of royalties and especially if you can buy them on good properties, good assets, and you have really smart capital allocators um, running the company. And so that's what we look for. And uh, so we love that exposure. We think it's great. And if and if, if gold does go up, continue to go up and silver go up, 
then all their future cash flows just go up with it. It's, it's a beautiful business. And the other big advantage associated with royalty companies is you remove all operating risk. Yes, which is a big, big factor. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to you know people in the mining industry. I won't mention their names, and they'll, they'll tell you. They'll say mining has got to be one of the toughest businesses you can possibly go into. And it's interesting. Some of them, you know, they get, it, it, but it, it's appealing because you know the, the asymmetric returns. I mean, you can you you either you know you either lo- can lose everything or you can sometimes just make hundreds and thousands of percents. And that's what keeps the allure and that's what keeps capital going into it, which is a capitalist market. For us, though, when we're, when we're investing for, you know, high net worth clients, medium net worth clients, people who have worked hard for their money, they're not really interested in losing anything. They want to build a base and they want a compounding on top of that base. I think the royalty companies are just safer or companies like a Nico Ego and uh, other leaders um, in their field. Those are the ones that um, our clients really are, are going to feel more comfortable with and where we can sleep well at night. And we don't have to be geologists and experts and, you know, tracking uh, into remote parts of the world and looking down holes that we don't really understand what's going on. You mentioned oil and gas and Warren Buffett is a big believer in oil and gas and a big investor in that sector uh, for the cash flowing element. What names are you invested in? Yes, um, we we also I mean, the, the more pressure that the world puts on the oil and gas industry from our perspective, um, it just means that uh, it's going to hold prices of oil and gas probably higher than they normally would if you didn't, if you know, if you if you didn't unleash all of the capital to develop these resources. And so you, we look at them as very cash flow generative businesses, just like Warren Buffett does. So we own Meg Energy here in Canada. We've also have some exposure to Suncor, Canadian Natural Resources. And so we're looking for the companies that have proven long term reserves are well run. These companies, again, um, they're generating so much cash. You take Meg Energy, um, they're just paying down some debt right now. And then all of the cash flow is going to go into share repurchases and uh, and dividends. And so um, we were buying some of these companies even two years ago, I think it was, you know, and they were like 15, 16, 17 percent free cash flow yields. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, you can buy a tech company at one and a half percent free cash flow yield, or you can buy an energy company at, you know, uh, in the teens, then we'll take some energy exposure. And the reality, James, is that we're going to need fossil fuels from here till eternity. And this idea that we're just going to eradicate our fossil fuel demand is incredibly naive, incredibly naive. And so, um, you know, from our perspective, uh, we think it's a long term place to be. And uh, we're quite happy to invest in renewable energies, also in some new opportunities. Uranium uh, is another space. I mean, I think nuclear is going to continue to be an important area also. But uh, fossil fuels is not going to disappear. And so if we can get exposure to some really well-run companies and great long-term resources where there's no wildcatting needed, you know, the, the reserve is there, it's proven, then we're going to buy some of those companies also. So we have about, I'd say, 6 7 8% of our assets in that space. And so you mentioned earlier, you don't like Canadian banks. What about Canadian telcos? They're all down on the year, but we only have three of them here, BCE, TELUS, and Rogers. What's your take there? Yeah, we, we have very limited exposure to telcos. And that's, I think, you, and that's only because we just think they're mediocre businesses and they're under a lot of pressure, uh, cost pressure. Um, and so when you only need 20, 25 stocks to own, we just don't need to be in that space. And so we have very minimal exposures. I think... A lot of times people are going for the dividend, but um, that can be risky also because you can jeopardize any capital growth or maybe have some capital losses. And so, yes, they are down. Interest rates have gone up. They're under a lot of pressure. Um, I think that, you know, there could be a little bit of a bounce on some of them up. But uh, for the long term, we just look at the business models as just being uh, weak and not the kind of business model that we are uh, interested in. And there, I mean, there could be erosion. We're always looking at uh, Starlink and other um, you know, ways that uh, they could be. Um, disintermediated over time um, through technology, and that, that also could be a problem. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's just an area that uh, we are not interested in. The one thing about Canadian banks and also the telcos, um, they nickel and dime you to death. <laughs> They're always hitting you with these fees. Well, the yeah, the Canadian banks are uh, you know monopolistic oligopoly basically, right? Um, let's be honest about it, and um, that's it actually is helpful for our business. I might say, James, because uh, many most of the clients that come to us come from the banks, and um, they're actually looking for more personal service, a little more differentiated uh, you know product offering, and and so forth. 
And so in some ways, the, the banks are our friends because they're just so large and bureaucratic and increasingly not overly service oriented in many cases. And so uh, so so I should I shouldn't I shouldn't put them down too much. That's an advantage for us. So I got to look at the, the I got to ask you about the Canadian stock market now and the S&P is currently up 12 percent on the year after being up 20 percent. In 2023, I'm not even going to mention the NASDAQ because the numbers are significantly higher, but the TSX or the Toronto Stock Exchange is up about 7% year to date. I'm not too sure what it was up last year, but there's no way it was anywhere near what the S&P was up. And as a, and then you talked about, you know, we both talked about the taxes and the excessive tax burden that we face as Canadian investors. We got a slowing economy. As a Canadian investor, how do you get ahead? Well, I think the, the, the benefit of being an investor is that you can target the companies you want to invest in and try to buy into the companies that are least affected by the bad Canadian um, government policies currently, currently, and hopefully those change. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can invite as investors, we don't have to invest in companies that are 100% exposed to Canada and all of the challenges within our own economy. So we can buy into the US, we can buy into Europe, we can buy Canadian based businesses that are making money all around the world. And so I think that, you know, for Canadians, um, what they need to really focus on is how can I best make sure my capital is going into the kind of businesses that can grow, um, can expand in in, uh, in in productive ways and are not um, hamstrung by um, bad Canadian policies and bad Canadian governments, which we're seeing, you know, not only our federal government, but many of our provincial governments too. So um, that's the way we get around it. And um, so we just invest outside of Canada or in businesses that maybe are Canadian based, but make money all around the world. And uh, I think that's probably the most productive way of, of doing it. And, and then at the same time, um, um, putting as much pressure on our, our leaders and our neighbors and so forth to say, hey, how can we change this? And let's let's be more let's be let's be looking through the resumes of the people that we're putting into power um, and making sure these policies really fit with uh, the best the best long term objectives of our country. Jonathan, as we wrap up, you've painted a pretty negative picture about the Canadian economy. What's it going to take to turn this economy around and to right the ship? Well, <laughs> if you, I'll, I'll give you a really uh, brutal and honest assessment, a, uh, a changing government uh, at the federal level. And I think in many of our provincial governments, too, many of them are, are not uh, running their, their provinces very well. But I think, look, we need we need to shrink the size of the state. The state is much too large. It's subsuming way too much of our of economy. We've got to lower taxes, not increase taxes. We need to unleash our extractive industries, our commodity industries. We should be uh, deregulating and making sure that we are maximizing our oil production, our gas production. We're exporting our natural gas into Europe and uh, into the into also into Japan, the, down to the Far East, where there's the needs. Um, we need to uh, be deregulating in, in so many areas, and uh, we need to you know, put more more of our economy into the private sector. So, if we're not committed to doing those things, shrinking the size of government, shrinking regulations, getting taxes down, balancing our budgets, um, and putting competent people into places of leadership, um, yeah, it's going to be a tougher go going forward. But if we could reverse some of those policies, this country is amazingly wealthy. The people are incredibly resilient. We've got a lot of talent in this country. And uh, we could we could really, um, I think, make a dramatic change um, in the country in a rel rel relatively short period of time. Um, but uh, we just need some of those tough decisions made. And I think Canadians are increasing, I think, at the point where um, they are looking for change. And so uh, let's just pray that that is the case. And uh, we have got the leaders that step in that are prepared to make those tough decisions. Well, that was a fascinating discussion, Jonathan. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. If someone would like to learn more about you and your firm, Rocklink, where can they go? Probably the best is just our website, which is rocklink.com and rocklink with a C at the end. So R O C K L I N C dot com and uh and to just go to that website and uh you, it's got our contact information info at rocklink.com and uh, you can contact us it's also got our phone number there 905-631-5462 and you can hit any one of the extensions that comes up and uh, we're there to service you and i uh, would love to uh, love to talk to you and as as uh, we do at the wealthy on anyone just wants to come in and uh, have a chat with us there's no pressure at all no cost we talk to any 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 Canadian that's interested in talking about their money, give us a shout.
Well, that's great. Once again, Jonathan, thank you. Thank you very much, James. Great talking with you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Jonathan Willem and he provided with some insights on what to expect in the coming months. I really enjoyed hearing his views, not only on the U.S. economy, but also the Canadian economy. We all need help when it comes to planning and preparing for our financial future. And if you need help, consider having a discussion with a Wealthion endorsed financial advisor at Wealthion.com. There's no obligation to work with any of these advisors. It's a free service that Wealthion offers to anyone who has an interest. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Wealthion.com, and also hit that notification button to be kept up to date on upcoming events. We have some amazing interviews coming out in the coming weeks that will help you prepare for your financial future. Once again, thank you for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.